Well, good evening, and welcome to another presentation from the Howia Diet. We're excited that you're with us this evening, and as we present a Metabolic Magic and a Plant-Based Diet, Be the Magic. And we have Dr. Hannah Kalahova with us this evening, and she'll be um, presenting a, a great presentation for us. We're excited to get there. Before we get into that, I'd like to just, uh, again, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Paul Malcolmus, the president of Howia Diet. And it's a real privilege to have you with us here um, in September. It's amazing how quickly this, this year seems to be going. But before we get started, how about if we just open up in a, in a word of prayer? Dear Lord, we just thank you for this, uh, for this day and this evening, Lord, and this opportunity to bring this information. We pray that you'll bless the presenter, Lord, and that all the technology will work, and that um, through the message here that we'll be able to help somebody with their health and improve their, improve their lifestyle, Lord. Thank you for... Um, um, all these many things that we're able to share, and um, we just hope we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, as we're going through the presentation this evening, there is a um, text box in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. If you have any issues, um, feel free to let us know, and we'll try to work you through the, through the issues there. Also use that text box there for any questions you have. We'll save your questions and bring them up at the end and um, be able to answer them then. So we're excited to have um, Dr. Kaliova with us this evening, and she's the Director of Research for the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, and she works with Dr. Neil Bernard. Um, Dr. Bernard um, has been a great partner with us for probably 20 years. Um, he's done many projects with us, so we're real excited to have Dr. Kaliova with us. She's an endo endocrinologist, I'm sorry, endocrinologist with a PhD in, in physiology. She's conducted several clinical trials that proved the power of a plant-based nutrition to improve oxidative stress and metabolic controls in patients with type 2 diabetes. She completed her postdoctoral research fellowship at the Loma Linda University in California, analyzing data from more than 50,000 people who were followed for up to more than seven years. So it's a real privilege to have you with us, um, Dr. Kaliova. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the nice introduction, Paul. Uh, uh, good, af good, e good evening, everyone. Uh, our topic, topic for tonight is metabolic magic. Uh, how many of you have ever wished for a magic pill that would boost your metabolism so that you could eat anything you want without gaining weight? You have an opportunity to say yes or no. Have you ever wished for a magic pill like this that would boost your metabolism so that you could eat anything you want without gaining weight? Please say yes or no, and we'll look at the results. So more than 80, 82, 83, come on, people, 84%, 85% people wish, have ever wished for such a pill. Uh, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? Uh, we usually wish for magic when we've exhausted all the conventional wisdom, when we uh, have reached the end of our resources. We wish for magic when our situation seems hopeless. Now, is it possible that we've reached such a point with the U.S. healthcare system? Let's take a look. Uh, the U.S. is the highest healthcare spender in the world, uh, spending 50% uh, more on healthcare than France or Sweden, the second and the third highest spenders. Now, with all the money spent on healthcare, um, does this also translate into better health outcomes, into lower mortality and morbidity rates? Uh, do people get less sick in the United States, and do they have longer life expectancy? What do you think? Do you think that all the money spent on health care results in better health outcomes when treating diabetes? You can say yes or no. And I'm looking at the results, and most of you are skeptical about that, 97%. Uh, think that um, the money 
will not be able to result uh, in better health outcomes, and you are correct. Uh, as an example, uh, let's look at diabetes prevalence. Uh, diabetes prevalence is one of the highest in the world, uh, higher than in Canada, uh, two times higher than in Sweden. Um, when people are getting more diabetes, uh, do we uh, at least treat them so well that their um, long-term complications are less prevalent? Do people with diabetes get less complications as a result of diabetes in the U.S.? What do you think? Unfortunately not. Um, the the prevalence of um, the adverse outcomes of diabetes, such as lower extremity amputations as a result of diabetes, are also one of the highest in the world in the U.S., five times higher than in Sweden. Now, do people at least live longer in the United States than in other high-income countries? What do you think? Cardiovascular mortality is also one of the highest in the world, in the U.S. It's three times higher than in Japan or France. In other words, uh, all the money spent on health care is not able to counteract uh, the, um, the adverse effects of uh, the unhealthy food on our plates. Now, if we know that the diet plays such a key role in the development of chronic disease. Could a plant-based diet be the magic? Um, a study from Harvard University uh, showed uh, that uh, almost 50% of cardiometabolic deaths in the United States could be prevented if people were eating less meat, less salt, less sugar-sweetened beverages, more whole grains, fruits, vegetables, and nuts and seeds. Uh, how do vegetarians do in terms of cardiovascular health? Uh, do they, uh, die, are they less likely to die from cardiovascular disease? Uh, one of the, the earliest studies um, in vegetarians uh, was done in Seventh-day Adventists, which are uh, which is one of the most healthy and um, longest living population in the world. The Seventh Day Adventists um, have many um, healthy lifestyle um, practices, uh, but they differ uh, in their animal product consumption. About 50% of them are non-vegetarian. Um, and one half is vegetarian, and 7% is even vegan, which means that they don't consume any animal products. Now, vegetarians, including both lacto-vegetarian who, who consume some dairy and eggs, and vegans, uh, all these together have a 40% lower cardiovascular mortality than their non-vegetarian counterparts. And uh, the Seventh-day Adventists also live up to 10 years longer compared with general population. Now, three out of four men and two out of three women are overweight or obese in the United States. Do you think that the plant, a plant-based diet can be the magic for obesity? The Adventist Health Study 2 showed a linear relationship between animal product consumption and uh, the body mass index and also diabetes prevalence. That means uh, the vegans uh, were the thinnest people uh, compared with a more liberal consumption of animal products, and the vegans also had uh, the lowest diabetes prevalence. Uh, now, do you know what the healthy BMI range is? Do you know how to calculate your body mass index? Uh, it's calculated when you take your body weight in kilograms and divide it by your height in, in meters um, 
uh, times two, and that's your body mass index. And the normal range uh, is up to 25. So please note that only vegans uh, were in the healthy body mass index range. Of course, it's the average. Um, there were people who were uh, overweight in each of these groups. However, the average is healthy only in the vegan uh, group. The lacto-vegetarians were slightly uh, overweight uh, on average with body mass index uh, 25.7. Now, what about the interventional uh, trials? Uh, Dr. Barnard was the first one to show that a low-fat vegan diet results uh, in a predictable weight loss of about one pound a week. So and these study participants were losing 13 pounds in 14 weeks, and they lost also two inches around their waistline, which is a whole new wardrobe, ladies, new dresses. We confirmed these results in our study with patients with type 2 diabetes. People on a, a plant-based diet were losing twice as much compared with a, a hypocaloric diet with the same amount of calories um, recommended by the American Diabetes Association. Uh, using an MRI technique, we also showed uh, that they were losing more visceral fat. Visceral fat is the fat around your inner organs that's the most metabolically dangerous. So losing more visceral fat translates into a better metabolic health. Believe it or not, um, but the plant-based diet also works in New Zealand. Again, the participants in the Broad study were losing about one pound a week. Uh, and uh, now we're coming to the question, why are the plant-based diets more effective than diets with the same amount of calories, but, a, but with a different macronutrient composition? How come plant-based diets are more efficient for weight loss? Any thoughts? What do you think? First of all, the energy density is lower in plant, in plant foods. Um, you can see that you can fill up your stomach with veggies um, while uh, if you eat the same amount of calories um, in meat, uh, you will not be able to feel as full because the sensors in your stomach will not be stimulated as much. And the same is true for oil. Um, some people think oil uh, is healthy food, extra virgin olive oil is healthy food, but keep it in mind that it's a concentrated uh, source of energy, so you need to use the oil sparingly. The other expl another explanation for the effectiveness of plant-based diets is a high content of fiber. Fiber works in different parts of our gastrointestinal tract to promote satiety and plays a key role in energy balance and weight regulation. We have more gut bacteria than we have cells in our body, and the gut bacteria composition uh, is important for our metabolic health. Lean people have a different gut bacteria composition compared with people who are struggling with their body weight. Um, now, the, a high-fat diet, a Western type of a diet um, rich in fast foods, uh, tends to disrupt the tight junctions in our gut, which results in um, the so-called leaky gut. And... Um, Subclinical inflammation is the result, uh, and uh, metab metabolic endotoxemia, uh, which results in a higher risk of obesity, diabetes, and uh, uh, fatty liver disease. Now, the larger uh, your microbiome diversity, uh, the greater the richness of the bacteria that uh, live in your gut, the better. Now, the gut bi microbiome diversity is, is different in different parts of the world. 
for example, children uh, in rural Africa or in people living in Latin America have a greater richness of their uh, gut bacteria um, than people living in Europe or in the United States. So the solution is to either move to Africa or to uh, learn the lesson and eat the plant-based foods that people are eating in Africa. Now, it's not only about um, the kinds of food they are eating. It's also about sanitation. Um, we sanitize so much that there's uh, almost no bacteria left on our food, which is not so great for the richness of our gut bacteria. So, for example, if you have your own garden, your own orchard, um, if you want to pick your apple from the tree, um, that's a good way how to promote the richness of your gut bacteria. Now, gut microbiome diversity can explain about 8% of your arterial function. Uh, your arteries should be um, very flexible. Um, if you start exercising and all the and you know start pumping all the blood, the vessels should be flexible enough to take in all the blood that's rushing in. Now, as we age, uh, our arteries tend to get stiffer and stiffer, especially due to uh, an unhealthy diet, which can speed up the process um, tremendously. Uh, and uh, 8% of the arterial stiffness can be explained by gut bacteria composition. But it's not only about the richness of your gut microbiome, it's also about the composition. Uh, children in rural Africa have more bacteroidetes, uh, that's a family of bacteria that have uh, beneficial metabolic effects, especially of Prevotella in dark green, while children living in Europe have more Firmicutes. And now the bacteroides to Firmicutes ratio is very important for our me metabolic health. It can explain about 22% of your cardiovascular fitness. So uh, your marathon time or your performance in the gym is to a large degree determined by your gut bacteria composition. That's why you need to feed your gut bacteria well, and we can do this especially through prebiotics in plant-based foods. Many people consume probiotics in yogurt and in other uh, foods that uh, contain bacteria. However, that's only a, a short-term solution. Uh, most of, of the bacteria that you consume in a yogurt, for example, are destroyed in the stomach. Uh, so a long-term solution is to give your gut bacteria the oligosaccharides that will feed them in, long, in the long term and will enable to, to grow over uh, the harmful bacteria in your gut. And all plant foods contain prebiotics. However, the largest, largest concentrations are found in garlic, onions, and whole grains. Our gut is not only important for, um, because of all the bacteria that live there, uh, it's also important for the secretion of incretins. Incretins are hormones secreted in our gut um, in response to meal intake, and they have pleiotropic effects. Uh, they regulate gastric emptying, they promote satiety, they decrease um, glucose production in, in the liver, they decrease glucagon levels. Uh, glucagon is the counter-regulator of insulin, and they also stimulate insulin secretion. The insulin stimulating uh, function is one of the most important 
in diabetes um, prevention. When you uh, receive an IV infusion uh, with some glucose in it, um, it will only uh, it will stimulate insulin production to to only a small degree, shown in the yellow line. If you get the same amount of glucose and ingest it orally, you will secrete a lot more insulin, shown in red. Now the difference between the IV and uh, oral ingestion of glucose and uh, the resultant insulin secretion is called the incretin effect. People with type 2 diabetes have a diminished incretin effect, which results in higher glucose levels in response to meal intake and delayed insulin secretion after the meals. Uh, now, the diminished incretin effect is one of the causal factors of developing diabetes, but also diabetes further diminishes the incretin effect, so it's a two-way street. As we know that especially fats impair the incretin signaling in beta cells, uh, we asked ourselves a question, could a plant-based diet be the magic for the incretin secretion? To answer this question, uh, my former PhD student, uh, Dr. Lenka Belinova, who successfully completed her PhD last year, she brought in 50 patients with type 2 diabetes to our lab early in the morning, and we uh, were taking their blood um, several times during, during the morning, and we were measuring their blood glucose plasma concentrations of insulin, C-peptide, and incretins released in their gut in response to meal intake. Now, what uh, did the meal look like? At what, me what meal did we look at? We were comparing two energy-matched meals, one vegan meal, one vegan sandwich, and one sandwich with processed meat. As expected, uh, the processed meat sandwich resulted in diminished incretin effect, while the vegan meal uh, resulted in a peak concentration of both incretins, both GLP-1 and GIP, the main incretin hormones. The effect was comparable to an effect seen in citagliptin, one of the drugs specifically developed to increase the incretin effect in patients with type 2 diabetes. In other words, the plant-based diet worked as a magic for incretin secretion. And we're talking about one meal only. Only one plant-based meal was able to uh, elicit uh, the incretin secretion that's seen in the drugs specifically developed for that. Do you know anyone uh, who's completely thin, no matter what they eat? They can even, their diet can be really terrible and they just don't gain weight. Do you know anyone like that? Would you like to boost your own metabolism? Do you think a plant-based diet could boost your metabolism? Let's look at the data. Um, newborns uh, have brown fat uh, for their thermoregulation. Uh, however, uh, not long ago, it, it's been discovered that also adults have brown fat, especially uh, along our spine and in the neck area. Now, why is brown fat important in adults? We don't need that for thermoregulation like newborns do, so why is it important? While our white fat only stores fat as, an, as extra energy, brown fat has the ability to release some of the energy in the form of heat. So it's a multi-million dollar industry to find a drug that will stimulate brown fat so that we can boost our metabolism. 
Um, fat morphology is different between white fat and brown fat. Brown fat is, a more, is more pink under the microscope because it has more uh, mitochondria. It's a lot more metabolically active. And I have good news for you tonight. We can even train our white fat in, to become beige, something in between white and brown. Now, how can we do that? Are there any foods that activate our brown fat? The good news is that, yes, uh, some plant foods are able to activate our brown fat. Hot peppers, jalapeno peppers, but also the amino acid L-arginine found in soy foods, beans, nuts, and seeds. So a variety of plant foods is able to activate our brown fat. What's the most efficient way how to activate our brown fat, except for the diet? Any guess? It's cold exposure. The winter is coming, so the cold will be stimulating your brown fat. And when the weather is hot, you can still take a cold shower. Another way how to activate your brown fat is exercise and also fasting. Turning up the heat has been suggested one of the effective strategies uh, in the prevention of obesity and type 2 diabetes. What does it mean in practical terms? How does it look like when you turn up the heat? Uh, have you ever noticed that when you eat a meal, you get warmer, you feel warmer? That's because after each meal, uh, there's some energy released in the form of heat, which is called the thermic effect of food. Now, are there any foods that are thermogenic more than others? Yes, there are some differences. For example, if you eat your sandwich with, a white, with white bread, your thermic effect of food will be lower than compared with a sandwich with a whole wheat bread. Dr. Barnard was the first one to show um, that when he put people on a plant-based diet, uh, there was a 16% increase in the thermic effect of food, which means um, the people who are consuming a plant-based diet were able to burn 16% more calories after each meal they were eating. Isn't that amazing? That means you can eat some extra calories and just burn them. How is the diabetes epidemic in the United States um, being explained by the lay public and also by the scientific um, uh, studies? Uh, one of the most prevalent explanations is high consumption of sugar. Many people believe that we experience the diabetes epidemic because of the high sugar consumption. Some scientific papers even use terms as toxic or pure, white, and deadly. We know that a high consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages um, is associated with an increased uh, incidence of type 2 diabetes by 18% per serving per day or by 13% per serving per day when adjusted for adiposity. However, uh, is this increased risk of di diabetes um, associated with sugar sweetened beverages due to sugar or fructose or extra calories we're consuming. So you can answer this question. Do you think that the sugar sweetened beverages are associated with an increased risk of obesity and diabetes because of sugar or because of the fructose? Is the high fructose corn syrup uh, the driver and the main culprit, or is it the extra calories? 
So 43% of you, oh, the numbers are still changing. Yes, please answer the question. So 33%, about one-third, thinks it's the sugar in the sugar-sweetened beverages. More than 50% think it's the fructose. So in other words, the high fructose corn syrup in the sugar-sweetened beverages is driving the obesity epidemic. And only 10%, or almost 11%, think it's the extra energy. So let's take a look. A recent meta-analysis um, looking, combining all studies published on sugar consumption and the incidence of type 2 diabetes showed um, that high sugar consumption was actually associated with a decreased incidence of type 2 diabetes. Uh, so sugar consumption was protective. Uh, in other words, uh, while I'm not suggesting that um, sugar is the ultimate um, cure for diabetes and we should, we should use it as a preventive tool, at least we can say it's not the driver of the diabetes epidemic in the United States. What about the fructose? In the same meta-analysis, the, the researchers sh showed um, that fructose was completely neutral. Fructose is not able to um, explain the diabetes epidemic in the United States either. The same authors also analyzed the total carbohydrates. Many people fear carbohydrates and they think um, they will too many carbohydrates will increase their risk of diabetes. However, total carbohydrates, including white sugar, including pasta, including rice and bread, uh, were completely neutral, more on the beneficial side. So it's not the carbs that are able to explain the epidemic of diabetes. It's the extra energy. Um, furthermore, and the sugar in the liquid form uh, is less satiating compared with sugar um, eaten with solid food. And also, high sugar consumption is a proxy for otherwise unhealthy lifestyle. You know, a sedentary lifestyle, a lot of fast food, smoking, and so on. However, the standards of care for diabetes recommended by the American Diabetes Association still include carb counting. Now, when people limit their carbohydrate intake, when they limit their bread and rice and potato intake, what are they mostly left up with? What do you think? Most people increase their meat intake. Now, does this look like a diet that will solve our diabetes epidemic? What do you think? A diet that's low in carbs and high in meat, um, does, how, how does this diet affect our uh, long-term risk of dying from any cause? A recent meta-analysis that... Um, combined four large cohort studies that included more than 200,000 people showed that low-carb diets are associated with a 31% higher all-cause mortality compared with high-carb diets that are more plant-based. Now, why is that? Why did, why did these people die? These people died especially of heart disease and cancer. Low-carb diets increase uh, the risk of cardiovascular disease by 14% and, cardi and cancer mortality by 28%. Now, what about the diabetes incidence? Uh, when people are following a low-carb diet, do they at least um, get less, are they uh, less likely to get diabetes? What do you think? No. 
Low-carb diets actually increase your risk of getting diabetes by 37%. So why would you even consider a low-carb diet as a tool for diabetes prevention or treatment when there are so many plant foods that can help you with your diabetes? Let's look at uh, the population studies. Um, the, the Adventist Health Study 2 showed that vegetarians have only half the risk of developing diabetes compared to general population. What about the interventional trials? While the population studies don't change um, the eating habits of the study participants, they only follow their diet. You know, the participants get questionnaires and they fill out these questions. So how often do you eat meat? How often do you eat dairy? And based on the questionnaires they fill out, for example, the questionnaire for the Adventist Health Study 2 is 50 pages long. So thanks to all of you who are a part of the study. Uh, you are a part of a great study that brings more light into um, the pathophysiology of diabetes. Uh, it's uh, Although filling out the questionnaire is time-consuming, nobody asks you to change your diet. However, the interventional trials changed the participants' diets. So uh, Dr. Barnard was the first one who showed that a plant-based diet is twice as efficient um, in the treatment of diabetes and in improving glycemic control compared to a standard diet recommended by the American Diabetes Association. We confirmed these results in our study, and we also looked at the specific mechanisms, particularly at the, at the oxidative stress, which is the main mechanism behind type 2 diabetes. Oxidative stress uh, is caused by the free radicals that are missing an electron and, I, and are highly reactive and result in oxidative damage. In an ideal situation, the free radical formation is counterbalanced by antioxidants in our body. However, in diabetes, the free radical formation is a lot higher than the antioxidant capacity. The oxidative stress um, is the main mechanism behind insulin resistance, uh, pancreatic beta cell failure, and diabe diabetic complications. Could a plant-based diet be the magic for oxidative stress with all the antioxidants in the plant foods? To answer this question, we invited 74 participants with type 2 diabetes and randomized them into uh, a vegan group or the control group. The control group was consuming a, a diet recommended by the American Diabetes Association. Both diets uh, contained the same amount of calories, and the participants well, were following the diet uh, for six months. It was not surprising to see that the plasma vitamin C levels were a lot higher in the vegan group. However, what was really exciting uh, was to see the large difference in the plasma concentrations of superoxidismutase or reduced glutathione, which are enzymes secreted in our body. In other words, the plant foods not only boosted um, and the antioxidant capacity and provided the antioxidants uh, through food, but they also boosted the body's ability uh, to produce antioxidants. In other words, the plant-based diet worked as a magic for oxidative stress. We are what we eat, and we're taking this um, literally right now, uh, you might remember from your biochemistry book how the cell membranes look like. Cell membranes um, are made up, made up um, 
by a phospholipid bilayer, and the lipids in the membrane um, contain lipids that we eat. If you eat a lot of plant foods, the polyunsaturated fats will make your cell membranes more flexible and fluid. Compared with saturated fat in animal foods, which will make your cell membranes more solid and rigid. Now, if your cell membranes are rigid, um, your insulin receptors will not work well. And this is the root cause of insulin resistance. Now, do you think a plant-based diet is so powerful that it can change the diabetes-specific signature on the cell membranes? What do you think? Yes, 100% of the participants think yes. You believe in the power of a plant-based diet. Excellent. Let me explain to you the diabetes signature. This is an exciting topic. So each person with diabetes has a specific diabetes signature on their cell membranes. Each cell, uh, each cell membrane in each cell of their bodies has a specific diabetes signature. The signature is composed of high concentrations of palmitate, one of the saturated fatty acids found mainly in dairy and white meats, and low concentrations of polyunsaturated fatty acids, especially the linoleic acid found uh, in plant foods. Now, um, the signature is so powerful that it can predict the development of metabolic syndrome and diabetes by several years. In other words, you can still have your blood glucose normal. However, um, if I test you and I see the signature on your cell membranes, I can tell you with confidence you will uh, have your diabetes within several years. Now, we know that the turnaround of the lipids in cell membranes is about four to six weeks. So when we change the diet, let's say we exclude all the animal products that are the source of saturated fatty acids, and we increase uh, the polyunsaturated fatty acid intake uh, through plant foods, do you think we're able to influence and change the diabetes signature? And do you believe in the power of a plant-based diet? And that's what we found in our study. Yes, we are able to change the signature. After uh, only 12 weeks of a plant-based diet, we saw a great increase in the linoleic acid um, com uh, composition or concentrations in the cell membranes which also correlated with a decrease in visceral fat, in the metabolically harmful fat, and increase in insulin sensitivity. In other words, a plant-based diet worked as a magic, magical eraser on the diabetes signature on the cell membranes. Some of our uh, everyday choices result in long-term consequences that are often um, irreversible to a certain degree at least. Fortunately, in skillful hands, even a seemingly hopeless cause may be, may be saved. As people are gaining weight and increasing their insulin resistance, uh, this places a huge demand on their insulin producing beta cells. By the time type 2 diabetes is diagnosed, about 50% of their beta cells are gone. It's a billion dollar industry to find a drug that will at least slow down uh, this, pro uh, this progress of beta cell dysfunction. Unfortunately, regardless of the pill you use for diabetes treatment, um, the beta cell loss keeps um, progressing.
even after type 2 diabetes um, diagnosis. It seems like we need some magic here. Could a plant-based diet be the magic for beta cell dysfunction, for beta cell failure in type 2 diabetes? To answer this question, uh, we enrolled uh, people who were overweight with body mass index between 28 and 40, who didn't have diabetes, however, who were at high risk of getting diabetes soon. And we randomized them to follow either a vegan diet or uh, a controlled diet. Uh, the mean age of our study participants was 53.2 years, and most of them were females. Uh, the participants were asked to follow the prescribed diet for 16 weeks. Uh, the vegan group um, was consume, consuming a diet that consisted of fruits, grains, legumes, and vegetables. And the control group was using the common strategies, counting carbs and limiting the portions. The participants were filling out three-day diet records at baseline and after 16 weeks. We brought in the study participants to our lab early in the morning, and we performed a standard liquid meal test, which contained 720 calories, 50% of which were carbohydrates. And we did timed blood draws, which enabled us uh, to quantify beta cell function. Physical activity uh, was the same at baseline and after 16 weeks in both groups, which is a good thing. We were trying to change their diet only. The self-reported energy intake uh, decreased by about 400 kilocalories in both groups. The macronutrient intake remained the same in the control group, while carb intake increased dramatically in the vegan group and their fat intake decreased. The, uh, the vegan group lost more, more weight. The treatment effect was about 14 pounds, which is great, um, but how about body composition? It wouldn't help if you lost more muscle, right? So did the plant-based diet result also in a greater uh, fat loss? What do you think? Yay! Two-thirds of the weight loss may be explained by fat loss. And the vegan group also lost more visceral fat. Their insulin resistance dropped more, and we observed a clear uh, dose response increase in insulin secretion, a clear improvement in beta cell function in the vegan group. Now, the next question is how much of this beneficial effect uh, can be explained by weight loss? The change in beta cell function and insulin resistance correlated only slightly uh, with changes in body mass index. In other words, um, bo body weight loss is able to um, explain only a part uh, of the beneficial effects of the diet. Most of it um, is specific for the plant-based diet. To give you an analogy, a Western type of a diet um, is whipping your beta cells to produce more and more insulin. It's like when you're in the gym, when you're tired and you are not able to perform anymore and you're just forcing yourself to lift more weight. But it's not an effective approach. We know that time to time we just need to take some rest which is, which is exactly what a plant-based diet um, provided for the beta cells. But due to a high fiber content, the plant-based diet also provided uh, regular exercise for the beta cells, regular workouts, so that the beta cells could get ripped. This picture clearly depicts the challenges that we face when we help our study participants in their transition towards a plant-based diet. 
and in bridging the gap uh, between uh, research and our culture. Fortunately, we have a good team and Dr. Barnard's leadership, and um, I hope we will realize the power of a plant-based diet. Uh, a small quote from uh, Thomas Edison, the doctor of the future will no longer treat the human frame with drugs, but rather will cure and prevent disease with nutrition. I'd like to encourage all of you to feed your beta cells well in order to improve your beta cell function. Thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to take your questions. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Kelly-Ogo. We, we really appreciate all the information. We definitely enlightening and such great research. And we do have a couple of questions. Um, and I believe you've done research on timing of meals and when to eat. Um, can you share any of that research? Uh, yeah, that might be a separate uh, presentation. Uh, but just briefly, uh, timing of the meals plays a key role. It's not only about what you eat, but also when you eat it and how many meals per day you eat. Uh, people who consume breakfast are leaner than those who skip breakfast. Although uh, people who eat breakfast uh, might even eat more calories during the day. Uh, eating um, your breakfast regularly and having the breakfast the largest meal of the day and the dinner, uh, the lightest meal of the day, is one of the uh, key uh, mechanisms behind um, weight management. Another important aspect uh, is to have only two to three meals per day with no snacks in between, which allows your body to fast Intermittent fasting has very beneficial effects on our metabolism. Um, so a large breakfast and a light dinner and no snacks. That's, that's great, and uh, thank you for that. And we have an, another um, participant here um, asking about the amount of calories. Um, is that important? So this person is a vegan but eats a lot, and about 20 pounds overweight. Um, is the, are the extra calories dangerous for even though she's on a, a vegan diet? Uh, yeah, so a vegan diet uh, is not the ultimate solution. I mean, you can overeat on a vegan diet. Uh, you can eat late at night, uh, so you can still gain weight even on a vegan diet. Also, uh, some people think that oils are um, health food, you know, especially olive oil, and they just dump their oil into their salads and their food. Uh, you need to keep in mind that oils are uh, concentrated sources of energy. So if you're struggling with body weight, you need to be careful, especially about your oil intake. Yep, that makes sense. Um, and the caller says they, they do eat a lot of oils and they eat late at night. So um, they appreciate yeah. that information. Yeah. Um, when you drink vegetable juices throughout the day, does that interrupt the intermittent fasting? Yes, it does. Uh, although vegetable juices are great, um, also eating uh, your vegetables whole is great. It interrupts intermittent fasting, so you want to have a, only several eating occasions during the day with no snacks in between. Only only drink your water in between your meals. Okay, and how much water would you recommend on a vegan diet? At least eight glasses. Um, so um, it translates into uh, about two liters, at least one, one and a half liter to two liters a day. When there's hot weather, when you exercise more, you might need even more. That's the minimum. Eight glasses is a minimum you need to drink per day. That sounds awesome. Well, we appreciate um, your information this evening and for taking the time to be with us. 
And um, is there any anything um, additional you'd like to share with the participants before we leave for the evening? Uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening, and I would like to encourage all of you to uh, give it a try. Um, we've shared some new information, uh, and you might experiment a little bit, and it's definitely uh, worth the try, and I would like to encourage all of you to uh, to do it. Well, thank you so much for being with us, um, Dr. Kaliova, and thank you, everyone, for um, joining us this evening, and we'll be back next month with a with another presentation. And until then, we uh, pray that you're in good health. Thank you, and have a good evening. Thanks for having me. Good evening. <laughs>